Neil Curry. Huh? Welcome to Free Range American, buddy. Holy crap. He lives what a half hour away and we half hour have, so. we've had to like it's good to be back <laughs> it's good to be back man it, hey you know it's good to see good people in such challenging times right mm-hmm. like I, I i i love that statement because it's been said and over said and said and over said for like a year since we've been in covid um so Remember when everyone thought 2021 was going to be the year? Like, <laughs> hey, 2021, it's going to get better. <laughs> it's going to get better. We're going to clean <laughs> and, it up. And then January 6th came. Yeah. yeah. And January 6th came and went. Now we're on the road to uh, the 20th, obviously. Uh, it looks like Biden's going to be inaugurated. Um, and, uh, you know, the the Senate and the House, everything, it's blew all the way through. So... Boy, what what does that look like for the gun industry, Neil? I, I, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Are you like where is is Neil Curry ready, Gunner? <laughs> what what's going on in your head? Well, I try to be optimistic. You you have to be optimistic. You know, if you be, if you become pessimistic, then things start to kind of go that way. Um, right. But it's a huge question mark. I mean, I get DMs, text messages, emails, phone calls all the time. People asking me like I'm the like the subject matter expert on what's going to go on in the industry, and I don't know. My guess is as good as anybody else's, but it it's looking it's looking like a dark few years for the gun industry. So, um, you know, with with all the new recent things that Twitter has put in place, I mean, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Google. I mean, right. credit processing companies, I mean, challenges we've always faced as a, as a gun company are now becoming 10 times over, even harder to deal with. I mean, essentially, the the Democrats, the anti-gun party, has all the ammunition in the world to use against us. Right. And it's scary. We just don't know. I mean, we're taking it a day at a time. And right now, it's like, what measures can we take to kind of mitigate the fallout from right. what's going to come? But at the end of the day... We're at the mercy of the government in this business, especially as a licensed dealer. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to deal with the ATF, the government on the guns we sell. We have to follow the policies or they shut us down. Right. So um, I guess time will tell, but we're, we're just doing what we can. We're selling guns to law-abiding citizens. We're, we're doing the background checks, the 4473s. And I mean, we're moving more guns now than we've ever moved in the history of of guns. You know, right. we've only been in business 11 years, but I don't think there's been a time even before that. Sandy Hook was probably the biggest spike in gun sales right. previous to this, but I think this blows that one out of the water. So, I mean, right now people can't even buy 30 out six ammo. Right. I mean, people come in looking for, hey, I need some hunting rounds. I need seven mm, 30 out six, 300 Win Mac, 300 rum. We're like, we don't get any of that. I mean, the ammo shortage is across the board. It's insane. When it's everything, right? So, you know, I have an auto loader here. It's a Dylan 1050. Uh, I can't find primers, depending, right? I, and I, I have like bullets and a few other things out here that are, like, you know, but I can't find very specific things and it's across the board, right? So it feels, what it feels to me like, and I've got a lot of things I want to like run by you, but it feels to me like people are arming up. That's the way that this thing feels. And I, I see it because I see it on YouTube and I see the rhetoric and I see um, the, we'll call it the very passionate portions of the United States on both the left and the right. And it feels like they're, they're, they're arming up. Uh, does that, do you feel that way running I, a shop? I absolutely feel that way. And, and I don't know if they're arming up to, you know, go out on offensive against the government. No, but no, I think I, I think I, they're arming up 100. percent You know, call it what you will, stockpiling or whatever. Our training courses have gone through the roof too, and most right. of our courses are booked out three months. Wow. But they're they're arming up for, you know, like a collapsing government. I think is more what they're arming up for. Right. Like if if shit goes if shit goes down, the government falls, and there's a battle within, and now we lose the infrastructure that we had here in the U.S. And law enforcement, everything else goes out the window. And, you know, we know what happens when when that happens. Now, you turn the lights off for 24 hours, it's all mayhem out on the streets. And the only way to defend yourself is with your own personal arms. Yeah. I, I was talking to my wife about this last night and she was asking me those questions, right? So what happens in these circumstances? And uh, 
because she's concerned, right? She's she's like, what's happening in these circumstances? And I said, you know, what happens is uh, basic services and logistics start to collapse. And when that starts to happen, then you have the more unstable and the these sections of the population that are, you know, we'll call it not prepared or and they're, they're not prepared and they're prepared for violence. Those people are looking to be exploitous in these circumstances. And then what that does is it just adds fuel to the fire because now, you know, support services and logistics is down or compromised. And then you have a bunch of exploitive, um, more violent individuals that are looking to um, take advantage of the opportunity. And then the services, law enforcement and fire and a lot of those things, they, they can't react fast enough. Uh, so it, my wife and I were talking and, and, um, and I was trying to explain what the collapse of, of infrastructure looks like and how do people kind of wrap their mind around it. I'm like, you know, it, it's different. I think it's different in a lot of a wide variety of, of circumstances and different cultures and different countries. I don't know necessarily the way it looks here. I'm not bleak enough to say that that's even going to happen. I think it's something that people have obviously thought their way through and they are arming themselves to at least protect their families in that form of circumstance. And we saw it, right? So with COVID, the strain on the public health system, the strain on law enforcement, the strain on public services, law enforcement, a lot of these cities were saying, hey, we, we, you're going to have to protect yourself. So protect yourselves. Uh, we we can't respond to anything. I think we talked about this on the yeah. last. It's, I feel like 2020 was a big social experiment conducted right. by the government. Yeah, where they're like, let's let's see what happens and how the the public reacts to you know X. And like you said, there was I mean the riots, the BLM riots, the um, the George Floyd riots, you know, all these riots that happened last summer in 2020 were basically unresponded to yes. by law enforcement. Law enforcement essentially said, hey, look, if we if we um, place ourselves into that situation, it's just going to escal- escalate things. It's going to make it worse. Right. Just be hands off, let them do their thing. And then when they're done burning buildings down, they're going to get tired, go home, and, and mom's going to make these guys their meatloaf, put them to yeah. bed in the basement, right? Right. They're going to get in their race car beds and... Yeah. Yeah. Tuck them in. in and then, but, yeah. And then know. the police can come in and we'll, we'll rebuild after. But if right. we, if we infiltrate ourselves or, or, uh, you know, place ourselves in that scenario, these guys are just going to get that much more emboldened and, and, you know, come after us. And it's just going to be this big thing. And then it gives the media, apparent, you know, this ammunition to say, Hey, look, the cops are bad. They were beating people with batons mm-hmm. yeah. in the street. Look at this footage. So they're like, it's just better if we just stay hands off. But then at the end of the day, then it's like, well, that's my business they're burning down or right. that's my house and the residential neighborhood I live in that they're in there with baseball bats and Molotov cocktails. And if you guys are going to come help me, well, I'm going to need a way to defend myself. More people are seeing that. And, and I think that those type of scenarios has brought more people into our gun store than we've ever seen before. Literally right. like old ladies coming in the store being like, hey, do you have a 38 special, like a revolver? My son mm-hmm. told me I should get a revolver. Um, and like the most common phrase over the gun counter is, I'm new to guns. What do you recommend? Mm-hmm. Well, what are you looking for? Something for home defense. Okay. And then we take them down that path of selecting a good firearm for them, right? But that's been the most common thing. I mean, usually most of your customers are repeat customers, people mm-hmm. who've been in the industry of shot, the range members, they have 10 guns already and they're just buying more because, you know, they like the hobby, they like to be prepared. But this year, I mean, I can't remember the number, it was like 10 million new gun owners in 2020 alone. So... Yeah. And, and again, I don't think these guys are planning like this no. huge overthrow of the government, but I think they want to be prepared for anything. It's like having food storage. And I've, I've been, I've been throwing this out for a, a freaking decade where it's like, Hey, look, it's cool that you guys have two years of food storage. That's super cool. Do you guys have any guns and ammunition to go with it? Well, right. no. Okay. Well now your food storage is Bob's food storage across the street. <laughs> yeah. The guy who has 10 yeah. AR-15s and ammo, if yeah. he gets hungry, because at the end of the day, if your kids are hungry, you're going to get food wherever you can. Yeah. So I, I mean, um, the, uh, in the military, what was the number one thing when you set up a patrol base? Number one thing was always security, yep. right? Before you, before you eat child, before you clean your guns, before you do anything, security has to be established. It's the first and last thing. Yeah. yeah. It's like, 
And, and I think people are starting to realize that where before they're like, no, man, we just need food. Everyone's pretty civil. You know, no one's going to come over to my house and steal my food storage. Yeah. Like we're, we're human beings. My analogy with that is, um, and I tell people, and I don't know if I've ever said this on the podcast, but it, several years ago, um, I was in Botswana working with the Botswana Defense Force and I got to go in and, and go into a cage with a female lion. And before I went in there, they threw like a quarter of a, some, you know, animal in there, basically like a kudu or something like that. I, I, I to be honest with you, I can't remember. <clears throat> and, um, and she was the, basically she, they had raised her from a cob. They fed her every day. You know, she, she wasn't part of a zoo as part of training in Botswana, as far as animal familiarization, how do they sound? How do they look? So when they're doing uh, either population control or counter poaching, they, they would have some type of awareness as to uh, what they they can or can't do, right? Um, and it, it, they fed her right before I went in there. And I was like, why are you guys feeding her? Didn't you guys raise her from a cub? And they're like, oh yeah, if she's full, she won't try to eat you. And I'm like, as I'm going into as the cage, as I'm like stepping that. in there, you know, it's like, so you, uh, what? Hold on. Wait, hold on guys. Are you guys like, are you guys serious? And they're like, yeah, we're dead serious. If if she's full, she's just, you can pet her and she's going to purr and she's totally fine. Don't worry about it. Like we've done this thousands of times, right? I was much younger. I, you know, I, I was like, well, oh, fuck it. I don't care. And I was wearing like running shorts. I looked like a big white chicken probably to her. And I was like, but I've got some pretty tasty thighs. I don't know. And, uh, but I thought about that in my analogy to people that use that is, well, we live in a civil society, right? And uh, I don't need to protect myself. I've heard that one, I don't know how many fucking times, right? I, we live in a civil society and I don't need to protect myself. I'm like, yeah, you're stepping into the cage right after the lion's been fed. You can pet her and scratch her ears and everything else. Starve her for a few days get in a cage with her and then see what happens because it's not going to go the way that it went when she was full. It's just not going to go that way. And this was something that they had raised from a cub. And I think when we look at society, we have to look at it as this is a civil lion that we've raised from a cub that is fed fat and happy. Now, when the civil society is not fed, it's not fat and it's not happy. Things get really fucking dicey real fast. And I'm, 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 I'm concerned because I've seen this, you know, for the last year, businesses are locked down. You know, people have been laid off or they're working from home. They're more isolated than they've ever been. So most people would classify the United States as unhealthy, psychologically unhappy. There's more suicides right now than there ever has been. And, you know, whether it's in the veteran community or just general American population, and now put some hunger in that, you got a really dangerous, really dangerous country, I think. I, I think you do. I think you got a really fucking dangerous country. And I think when I look at it, concerns me across the board because people have every right to be angry too, right? They really do. Absolutely. You know, lockdown procedures in these businesses, you know, 30% of the small businesses in California, I think it might actually be trending up towards 40%. They're gone and they're not coming back. And there's such an incoherent, disjointed piece of pieces of information coming out of the government and then individual municipalities being able to control this and not control that. And then, you know, you have to wear a mask here. You don't have to wear a mask there and, you know, shut down your business, but you can, you know. The, the lack of standard and hypocrisy, I think is a huge issue among the government and in the public. I mean, whatever faith they had in the government is gone. Yeah. It's absolutely gone on both sides. I don't care if you're a Democrat, you know, um, or a Republican, but the government is completely um, exposed all their cards last year and this year. Essentially, it's like, look, you guys really aren't for the people. Like it, it's like mom and dad fighting at the dinner table and they're yeah. both fucking drunk. And the kids are sitting there, you know, yelling, mom, dad, you got to quit fighting. And they're both at fault. 
Right. And the ones that are suffering are the freaking kids, you know? So I, we're, like you said, we're, we're at the threshold of something like right now. I mean, this could go either one way or another. And I think, I think the first, you know, few months of, of 2021 are going to tell either these guys get their shit together or <clears throat> the constituents that voted all these guys in, <clears throat> they're going to start biting back. Well, <clears throat> well people, me. you know, they need their rights. Like they need their rights. That's the thing. And I, and I think that people just continue to fail to recognize that the government doesn't give you your rights. You're born with those. And it's not that the government's job to give you your, your individual rights or your ability to pursue happiness. And it, it really frustrates me to see the individual municipalities in America that have so much perceived authority. Um, you know, if I was a, in a situation where I had a restaurant that I needed to keep open to feed my family, you know, you'd be hard pressed to, to keep, you know, like they'd have to come out and shut me down every day. So here's what, here's what I don't understand. So as, as a business owner, um, and obviously our, our industry, my industry, I've been lucky enough and I'm grateful for it that, uh, we've, we've thrived under these circumstances. Right. And you always hate saying as a gun owner, like, yeah, business has been great because the world is on fire, you right. know? So everyone's buying guns because there's a lot of fear going on right now. And it's been so good for business. It's great. I love it. You know, you, you hate saying that like, Hey, how's business? So it's, it's good. The it's world's good. on fire. We're yeah. doing great. And then you have these restaurant owners who, who aren't, you know, they can't, our, our, my favorite restaurant in Provo, Bombay house. We haven't been able to go eat dinner there for a year, you know? And they're, they're living off the fast food pickups, you know, people order in and that's minimal. Yeah. So these guys are barely scraping by, but at what point, I mean, everyone kind of resorts to, well, we need to, we need to raise arms against the government. We need to, we need to march and, and go and throw these guys out of office and have these uh, local lynchings. It's like, okay, well, before we get to that point, like, let's look at all our options before that. So when are all the business owners in a community, let's right. say, let's say Orem, Utah, going to get together and say, look, there's 10,000 of us here. We pay property taxes, income tax, all the other taxes, retail taxes we pay to the government, right? Which is good. We need it for infrastructure and everything else. Um, to an extent, I don't want to sound like I'm super pro tax here, but, um, no, but there, there, there needs to be some, some, some tax to essentially pay for the infrastructure that we sure. live in, right? At some I, point. I don't level. disagree with that. I, I think that there is a definitive need for taxation. You know, there's a lot of guys who are like, you know, any taxation is theft. I'm like, yeah, but you know, we, we have communities and ultimately we all have to agree that these are kind of basic services that we need to provide one another. I think excessive taxation is one of the reasons why yeah. we have a, a country. <laughs> so there's a difference between kind of, I think, reasonable and or, or acceptable taxation. And then it's got to be reasonable taxation. It's got to be yeah. reasonable. Right. Yeah. Uh, are, when are we going to get together as a 10,000 business owners and say, Hey, look, we're, we're not, we're not going to play this game anymore. Right. You know, we're not, we're not gonna force whatever the, whatever the cause is. We're not going to close our restaurants down because you told us to, we're going to stay open. We're going to let people in. Um, we're going to make the decision on our own, whether we make people wear masks or not, or we post a sign on the door, like we did a ready gunner that says, um, you know, you can wear a mask if you want. Don't wear a mask if you don't want to. That's your choice. You know, as as a free citizen of the U.S., it is your choice whether you want to or not wear a mask in our store. And we're not going to tell you what to do, right? But come in, sit down, have dinner. If you're scared of COVID, you don't have to come or, you wear, your, come. or, or wear your mask. You don't have to come. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to shut down because you tell me to shut down. I got to run my business. I got to feed my family. I got to pay my employees and so they can feed their families. And there's nothing you can do about it because there's 10,000 of us who right. pay your wages, who pay the taxes. And if you're going to fight us on it, guess what? I'm not paying my taxes next month. Right. All 10,000 of us, we're not paying our taxes next month. What are you going to do? There's 10,000 of us. But, and I guess that that's the thing where um, I've, I've looked at this and I'm looking at it thinking, okay, so are they, is the community standard? Because Local business owners, I think for the most part, we, 
when we talk to each other, we're saying, hey, we're going to put in place a standard of cleanliness and you know policies and procedures that will protect our customers and our employees. At the end of the day, we have to conduct commerce. Like that's how this whole shit show moves around. And when I say that, it's like that's that's why we have you know fifty states in the United States of America, our ability to go you know take on Chinese debt, uh, all those great things, is because people know that ultimately commerce will happen. And I don't know where the second and third order effects of a person that says we will shut down businesses indefinitely. Uh, where is that person's head? You know, uh, these politicians aren't economists. Uh, I mean, most of them, I don't, I'm not quite sure if they could, you know, balance a checkbook, to be honest with you. But every economist, that I shouldn't say every economist, but the economists that I've read that were 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 assessing this situation from either the Wall Street, well, uh, not when I say Wall Street, um, you know, the Wall Street Post or one of these other organizations, um, news organizations, is said the long term economic effects of government shutdowns and businesses will continue to have a long tail effect on our economy that will last through multiple administrations. My response to this is as we roll out kind of our, our plan on the pandemic, right? A good example of, of this is you cross a state line and it could be arbitrary. And then there's different pandemic restrictions in every 50 different states. There's different pandemic restrictions in every one of these towns. Uh, when do people decide, well, and this is one of the things I really, I do appreciate and love about this country is that if California sucks, you can move to Texas or Idaho or we've seen Utah. A lot of that this year. Yeah, yeah, we've seen a lot of that. <laughs> but when you give the federal government <clears throat> the authority, now it's policy through 50 states. Now we have a real problem because we can't fucking move out a bad policy. Because now it's policy throughout 50 states, which is brings me into my ATF conversation, which is like the ATF and the our, our gun rights, individual gun rights, people say, we don't, uh, I say, hey, push it down to the municipalities again, because at least if we're having those conversations on the, on the, in the state and local level, the federal government won't be dictating policy and we can move out of states and go to freer states. Like we can go to Wyoming and Utah and Texas and all these other places that are free states and they'll attract more people that are like-minded that don't want to be, uh, they don't want their individual liberties to be trampled on. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen in, in California is these, not that Californians are crazy. I'm saying their policies a lot in a lot of these cities and states are fucking insane for small business. They're insane for individual liberty. And it and that's cool. If people want to live there, like, okay, cool, man. Like, go to Los Angeles. That's your that's where you want to live. Or New York City. Like, okay, that's great. You want to live there? You want to live under those policies, restraints, and you want to, you know, uh choke your individual liberty? Go ahead. Sounds good to me. I don't want to live in New York or Los Angeles. So truly, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I heard it was like 600,000 people migrated out of California in 2020 <clears throat> to the point where I don't know if this was, I don't think this has ever happened. I mean, it would, it'd be pretty insane, but I heard Governor Newsom was looking at imposing like an exit tax. If you're moving out of California, we're going to tax you to essentially leave the state. Yeah. The amount of California license plates I've seen in Utah is insane this year. I yeah. mean, I, you can't get to go down the street without seeing California license plates. And, and I have no issue with, with people like-minded moving from one state to another. If they're trying to escape the circumstances in which they're living in currently, as long as they don't bring those issues here and, and essentially transform Utah and California. But well, That's what we're seeing. <clears throat> we're seeing it in Texas because you're seeing it in Austin and yeah. you're seeing it it, it, Texas in a lot been, of these different states. Yeah. Yeah, Idaho is the same way. I was just getting, I just got back from Idaho. It was the same way. Lots of Californians. And there's a lot of good, great, I mean, there's 
millions and millions of people that are incredible people from California. They're like, Hey, I need to go somewhere where people are like me, where, you know, I can run with my dog off a fucking leash and not get, you know, a $400 ticket when my golden retriever that's 18 years old is, you know, in threat of, you know, maiming some child or whatever. Right. It's like, well, you can go to a lot of these places and you can actually live a free life. I couldn't imagine living in an urban area under the thumb of guys like Gavin Newsom, which, oh, by the way, he, he where his restaurant is that he invested in is one of the only areas of town where you can go get a meal. Just, just, just so ha- it just so happens that the governor. Yeah. I, I don't. Th- <laughs> I don't think politicians are even trying to hide how how crooked they are anymore. Uh-huh. It's out in the open. And, and they're pretty bold because now it's just like, hey, we're not even trying to hide it. It's just a big F you. What are you going to do about it? I am, Nothing. I am the governor. I am the yeah. king. I'm the and king And you are California. my servant. You are the peasant. You are my pawn. There's nothing you can do about it. So they say, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, unless we unite like we were talking about. Business owners are essentially the heart of America. Mm-hmm. You know, capitalism, hate or not, it's what makes America go around. The flow of money um, is what what gives people their livelihood. So I think business owners is like the front line of this of this uh, war, whatever you want to call it, against the government. Where it's like, look, we need to we need to make a stance, not not an arm stance, but we need to make a stance from a financial standpoint and say, look, hey, we yeah. hold, we hold all the cards, and this is what we're going to do. You know, we're gonna we're making the rules now, not you. Civil we'll disobedience work together. from a business perspective would be, you know, from a nationwide civil disobedience business perspective would be the equivalent of. Millions of businesses stopping, like if they stop paying their taxes, guess what would happen? Oh yeah, for one, like everybody just doesn't pay their taxes for one round, one month, one round. Like you know, it's the same thing as Instagram. Everyone doesn't post, or you don't even get on Mm -hmm. Instagram for twenty four hours. You don't make a post. You don't get on. You don't comment. You don't open your freaking app for twenty four hours on Facebook and Instagram. You know what that would do to them, man. It would devastate if, if you them. if you could somehow communicate that and everybody followed through with it, it would be great, actually. Well, people would eventually start listening. And there's a lot of really, I think, incredible minds that are out there that have been talking about these things like way smarter than than me for sure. And it's interesting that we're we're all having this like civil liberties conversation because of you know, restrictions of social media, obviously with Twitter removing Donald Trump and Facebook removing Trump and Parler being like kicked off uh, AWS. There's like so many things going on. And my fear is that people won't respect the, the first amendment anymore. And now, and the second amendment has been vilified so much that when you have blue all the way through, and I, I don't, by the way, I, I don't like, you know, Democrat House, Democrat Senate, Democrat President, right? Uh, now, if we've villainized the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, like where does this go? As a, as a modern American society, we villainize freedom? <laughs> like, I don't know, like what the fuck is going on? Because it's like, for me, it breaks my mind where people will opt in to forfeit liberty and they'll say, well, but it's for the greater good. And you're like, it's never for the greater good. I don't know what you're, I don't know what the fuck you guys are talking about. Like, you know, you forfeiting individual liberty is never a good idea. Like, and that should always be the stance of, from my perspective, whether you're a business owner or an individual, freedom is always the the cornerstone of happiness. It's like the founding fathers knew what they were talking about it's when, weird, when they right? did the Constitution. I mean, you think about it, the First Amendment. So communication, you, you're going into it, going back to a military standpoint perspective. Communication is the first thing you knock out, right? You're going in, yeah. you're like, hey, let's take out that satellite dish, let's Gotta take, take out the communication. Yep. So these guys can't communicate, call them reinforcements, whatever it is. The th- second thing is security. Yeah. You know, security. The Second Amendment is what. Is, is essentially the founding father saying we have to give the common citizen the ability to defend themselves against tyranny or anything else. And that's why that's number one and two. And that's why it's the first thing they're going after. It's almost yeah. like the politicians see this 
this this uprising or, or this anti-government movement because these guys have been so uh, unconstitutional and they've been pushing all these new agendas and federal government laws. You know, like I agree with you where it's, you know, federal government, sh- they have a place and it's a very small place in in making law and rule for 50 states. You know, the laws in state, every state's different. Populations are different. Demographics are different. All that needs to be dictated by the government of that state. And then we vote for those politicians and we vote for those laws within our own community. You know, like who who is the government to say, hey, we're going to put a 50 state wide ban on on assault rifles or or whatever it is, which or it's like you don't really even know what's going on in my state, you know, because crime is high in Chicago. You want to ban guns in Orem? Yeah. Or, and that could be anything. That could be anything. anything, It's rural Wyoming and Idaho is much different than, you know, downtown Seattle, right? So blanket federal policies that cover all 50 states that think that it's a one size fits all, those typically, and and it's just a kind of a data play, right? Where it's, you know, 300 and what, 30 million people, 40 million people in the United States uh, that, when you say we're going to do something for 340 million people, it's going to fit really well for a small portion of that, which is ultimately a big portion when it comes to voting block, but it's not going to fit very well for a huge percentage of everyone. And, you know, we've seen it. So it's, 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 it's interesting to me because I see this and I've talked to like, you know, Dan Crenshaw about it. I've talked to a few other people that are really sophisticated in politics. And one of the points that that I forget who was making it, but they're talking about education and student loan forgiveness. And they're talking about, you know, federal policies directly related to student loans. It's like the government already controls that. Like you guys understand, like nobody understands that. Nobody's talking about that on either, you know, I don't know if they're talking about it on either side, but the government already controls what banks give loans to higher education. They, they monopolized that during the, the Obama administration. They changed all that. So if they want to forgive debt or decrease interest or change the way that things are, things are going, they can do that. That's, that's, that's fine. I think that the problem exists at a much deeper level. And ultimately, when we talk about those things, but when we say 50 states, 50 state education policy, 340 million people like, wow, man, the, the arrogance and the assumption of the, you know, our federal politicians to believe that they can do this policy that fits everybody and it's going to work great. Uh, I think there are a few things that, that, that obviously the federal government does relatively well. I mean, we have a incredible standing army, right? We, it's, I think one of the charters of the federal government is to protect its population. Uh, We've done a really good job of getting in foreign wars that don't necessarily jeopardize the the sovereignty of the United States over the last two decades. You know, nobody can convince me that Saddam Hussein was going to uh, mount a surface war in the United States. It's just, it was is a war of choice, right? And when we look at wars of choice, and we look at wars, and we look at what the federal government is there to do for us is to protect the American citizens. Uh, I think seeing how the military industrial complex has directly manipulated the federal government's use of the the military and foreign war intervention, that should all give everybody a super deep hesitation as to how much control and power do we really want to give the federal government? Because ultimately we could be trillions of dollars in debt years behind, you know, real strategic enemies like China and Russia, because we've been fucking around in these dumb wars of choice. And now when we find ourselves like with all this exterior focus, there hasn't been enough domestic focus, right? So we haven't been rebuilding infrastructure and advancing technology and investing in small business and investing in individual liberty of their, our citizens. Now we find ourselves in these situations where we're like completely upside down in debt. We're behind in technology from China. And now we've got this fucking pandemic and we got to shut down all of our small businesses, which puts us even further behind. So from a business perspective and a guy that loves freedom, and I I have a really 
hard time digesting it like just in in just like factual information and digesting it holistically and that was one of the reasons why, what I want to talk to you about was as we look into the future we look at the gun industry you know air15.com was shut down uh you know payment processors are shutting down like it seems like left and right where do you see What's the first thing that they're going, the, you know, our new Congress, Senate, and White House, what do you think the first thing that they're going to go for is as far as gun rights? Well, so I think there's already been five or six things have been proposed. You know, um, they're, they're trying to hire 200 new ATF agents to essentially push new regulation. Um, I should have pulled them up, but some 200? of them, 200 new ATF agents. I think so in, the, in, this, in this new proposed bill, it says uh, for the hiring of 200 ATF agents, you know, to enforce gun, new, new gun laws. And then there's five things after that. Um, obviously magazine restrictions. Um, one of the big ones, and this one was a scary one is, uh, how you store essentially firearms in your home. So new storage laws on securing firearms within your own home business, wherever it is that you may have a firearm, like they have to be locked. It doesn't really break out in that bill, how that has to be stored. But there's going to be some policy where like, if it's not stored like this, if you don't have a safe with a 35 digit code, you know, retina scanner, whatever it is, and that gun gets used in a crime. Uh, now Evan Hafer, that's, uh, your gun was used to murder people. It was used in a shooting or something. Now you're going to the jail for a hundred years, you know, because it's your Fox and it's your carry gun. Interesting. Um, there's obviously the one thing that wasn't on there, because I think this is going to be a stand standalone bill. And I think this bill will be proposed as soon as Biden is in office. And I bet you it's in effect before the summer was going to be an assault rifle ban. Right. So everybody's been talking about that. We haven't seen the bill yet, but it's going to, it's going to be there. We know that for a hundred percent. And then with the control they have now, it's, I'm sure they'll push it through. It'll get passed before, before the summer. So magazine restrictions, storage restrictions, AR restrictions. Um, the verbiage of one of them was just uh, semi-automatic firearms. <laughs> and, th- and, think, and think what falls into that category. Everything. Yeah. Handguns. Yeah. You know, uh, they're semi automatic shotguns. Um, all, obviously, your AR 15s, I mean, most guns are semi automatics. Sure. So it's not even assault rifle, it's semi automatic guns, universal background checks. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and going back to the federal government, one of the funny things is, you know, we don't need a second amendment. We'll take care of you. You don't need those. Like, <laughs> why do you, why do we have 15 aircraft carriers? Yeah. You know? <laughs> why do we have the biggest military? You know, we believe in the second amendment for a country as a whole, which I, which is great. But what about on an individual basis? You know, why can you guys have 15 aircraft carriers and, and a special operations community and, and all these infantry units, but I can't have a gun for my house. So, I mean, it's, it's all going to come down the pipe. We'll, we'll have to live with it. Um, right. For, for the next couple of years or, or four years or definitely until some politician well, changes it. And I, that's I, I where think the that's fight the is. danger, right? Where it's like, we're, you know, as we see the restriction of information. So it's restriction of information across the board on social media platforms. So, you know, being able to educate people uh, on just individual freedom and liberty, right? And, uh, you know, the encroachment and increase of federal government and law enforcement. I think one thing that I'm always kind of in favor of is smaller government footprints, right? I, 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 I don't think a bureaucrat from, well, we saw it with... Uh, Honey Badger. Like we saw it with Q's Honey Badger. We saw braces. it. Yeah, with braces. Is some bureaucrat somewhere decides arbitrarily that this doesn't work, signs into policy. And these are part of the problems that we continue to run into. And I think this is part of the the, the problem across the board is when individuals or a group of bureaucrats that are disconnected from, we'll call it the subculture or the people are making decisions for 340 million people um, in a vacuum. Like that's a very dangerous thing for people to do and not because there's violence. I'm saying 
you're never going to come up with a policy that really fits for the majority of Americans. It just doesn't, in my mind, it just doesn't work. I don't, you know, I don't disagree with, um, you know, the majority of our law enforcement entities, I, I believe in what they do. When I say like, I believe in what they do across the board, I think there's a ton of incredibly hardworking, heroic men and women out there, like really protecting and serving their communities. Um, you know, I think when you have multiple layers of ambiguous laws that ultimately can be interpreted and then enforced by individuals that just basically pull some shit out of their ass. When I say that, like the, the, the Q brace, like there wasn't a specification, right? There wasn't a length or width or a specification and they could basically leave or, this. Or backing for such a decision at all. Right. So they could leave it, amb- they could leave it ambiguous and then enforce it and then it's up to the individual business or the individual to defend against. Well, fuck, how do you defend against something that's just like a general interpretation? Yeah. <laughs> like, like specify it and then you can kind of put it in black and white. And I think, I think the only way I see this kind of moving forward is the the legal system itself and kind of the political and legal system and then small business owners and people that really kind of want to reinforce this narrative, individual liberty and freedom. There has to be kind of a unification of those things. There's a lot of very, very influential people that still believe in freedom, right? And, you know, I listen to those guys. I think there's some incredible thought leaders in our communities that continue to put out like, hey, this is, this is wrong. You know, muting people's voices, uh, shutting down businesses. These are wrong. I mean, um, Dave Portnoy is a great example. He's out there beating the drum for small businesses in New York like every fucking day and putting his ass on the line, you know, and good for him. Yeah. Like he's taking and holding people accountable and holding them to task for their bullshit policies that are completely contradictory. And ultimately they're, they're hypocritical. It's like, how are you supposed to interpret these fucking rules and regulations related to a pandemic and keep your customers and your employees safe when the target's always shifting? It's like two weeks here, two weeks there. You know, it's super dangerous. It's not, you know, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Like, holy fuck. There's nothing that you can ultimately kind of put in as a cornerstone to protect yourself and your business and your family because the target's always shifting. The narrative's always shifting. Every week they put, you know, a different politicizing event happens where it's like, we all got to get the vaccine. Well, that's the other thing too, is you have all these, these new laws that get in place, but it doesn't change the numbers at all. I mean, here in the state of Utah, you know, the, the mask mandate went into place. What was it? November 1st or something yeah. like that. So we're three months going on this mask mandate across the state. Everybody has to wear it. You step outside of your house, you put that mask on. It hasn't affected the COVID rates at all. Like you, they've increased. I, yeah. I get this. I get this really annoying. I need to turn it off notification from, from KSL, our local news station here that says, Hey, today's COVID, um, it, you know, numbers, numbers right? are, yeah. you know, 3000, this many dead, whatever. It hasn't changed. In fact, it's probably gone up. It has gone up. So it's like, well, Hey, that's, that's really working. Let's keep going down that path. Um, but yet we're killing small businesses in the meanwhile, it's like, look, it hasn't made a dent in the numbers but we're still doing it for, for what reason? I mean, businesses are suffering. At least let's pick one, one, one thing. Like let's not wear masks and at least business owners can thrive, pay their bills and pay their employees. And let's come up with another solution for this COVID thing. But the masking isn't working, you know, keeping people at home isn't working. Let them go out, let them meet, let people run their businesses. And I don't understand, I guess, you know, you see it obviously running your business, 
You see a lot of people come in and out of your business on a daily basis. And, you know, we see it because we have our coffee shop here. You know, a lot of people are still going out and conducting commerce, which absolutely. There's this hysteria and the overarching conversation in America and the reason that people are shutting down their businesses because of the mortality rate, right? It's a deadly pandemic and it's a mortality rate. They're not talking about the psychological health of the American public. They're not talking about their individual health. They're not talking about any of the underlying uh, morbidity issues that directly contribute to anyone's death directly related to this pandemic. They're not talking about that. They're not talking about go get more vitamin D. They're not talking about going and getting more sunlight and being social, like taking away people's ability to be social and go out and conducting commerce in a social way is directly psychologically beneficial. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people have done some great satire in the last, you know, uh, oh, the year memes, on the memes, this. The memes have been great. It's like, you know. wear your mask, stay at home, you know, buy your Amazon and eat shitty food. And ultimately that's going to make you, you know, keep you safe. And it's like, yeah. well, I've had COVID. Like, I think you had COVID too, right? Yeah. Yeah. We both had COVID. It lasted a week. Nobody else in my house got it. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't take it serious, but I, a few years ago, I had the bird flu and holy fuck, like, or swine flu. There was this swine flu that I had and holy fuck, man. Like that thing made me like, I, I wanted to die. Like it, it was, it was brutal. And I was like in my early thirties, you know, now I'm 43 and I had this and I didn't get a cough. I didn't lose my sense of smell or taste. You know, I take a fuck ton of vitamin D. I socialize throughout the days with my company on, you know, Zoom and, you know, get to have great conversations like this. And like, I'm not going to let somebody fucking tell me that, especially the government, like this is the point I wanted to make. The government is not built for these things. So let's go back to the food pyramid that these dum-dums made like how many years ago when they were like, oh, well, the the the, the cornerstone of health is in grains. In grains, yep. And <laughs> in all reality, like you have to flip that thing upside down to actually have a healthy diet, for instance, right? Like, oh, don't eat meat and don't eat vegetables and but eat all the fucking grains you want and you know, low fat, high grains, blah, blah, blah. These are the same, this is the same institution that published the food pyramid that was ultimately impacted by corn, dairy, and the, 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 the large scale corporations in America that wanted something out of this. Right. And they were, and they're fucking killing people. I mean, morbid obesity in the, in the United States is, is, is a higher percentage. We have a higher percentage of morbid obesity in the United States than we ever have. I think heart disease is the number one cause of death in the U.S., isn't it? It's the number one cause of death. Yeah. And I'm like, when are people going to say, these people do not have the authority to dictate what is healthy to me? Like, We're acting like this is the first pandemic the U.S. has seen. Like, right. <clears throat> we've never had a pandemic before. COVID-19 is the first pandemics to hit the shores of the U S right. and, and like, Oh, we've, we've never done this before. We're going to have to try and test all these measures, the mass things, this new, this new, uh, vaccine. It's like, well, we've had H1N1, we've had swine flu. I mean, we've had dozens and dozens of dozens. And, and for those, what did we do? Obviously we took measures, but nothing to the drastic point of this. And it's not like COVID-19 is that much worse, if even worse than any of those. No. You know, when we made, and we made it through that, but look at the fallout from, from, you know, the political changes that we've made, the the business changes and everything else. It, I mean, it's completely killed the economy. Like you said, suicide rates are up. People are more depressed than ever. Morale in the U S is at an all time low. If there was a way to measure that, you know, if there's a poll to measure morale in the U S then it, I mean, it's, it's horrible. And if I'm a strategic threat, right. To the United States right now. And that's what I think a lot of people really need to like really look at. If I'm a strategic threat, if I'm China or Russia, these guys are completely coherent in what 
their exploitive notions are. They want this to happen. They want the country to be divided. They want us to to be completely divided. And then they also want us to devalue our government systems. They want us to not believe in the rule of law. They they want all of this. I, they I, feel, want like this. I feel like there's a COVID-19 hit is fulfilling some political cause, in my opinion. You know, call me a conspiracy theorist or whatever, whatever you want. But at the end of the day, I mean, there there is no reason for doing the things we have done. And and you're right. Can you imagine a football team? <clears throat> you have the defense team and the offense team completely hate each other, yeah. right? Where they're fighting the same the same goal to beat the opposing team, but the offense and defense can't get along. They're blaming each other. They're fighting among each other. At the end of the day, they get slaughtered by the opposing team because they can't work together. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, if you think about it as a whole, like we're all Americans, we all live in the same country. We all want the same things. We want the same freedoms and everything else. And obviously there's disagreements that happen there. You know, some people say, Hey, uh, the government shouldn't pay for college loans. You decided to go to college. You took out those loans. You you want to go into whatever field you want to go into. And like every person before you, they had to pay those loans off once right. you went into that trade. You know, you got little Susie, 21 year old girl, whoever, who took out a $60,000 loan to get her, her uh, bachelor's degree and whatever it is. And, you know, for her, it's a huge burden. She has these huge financial debts. She has to pay every 30 days. And uh, obviously, it'd be nice if the government came in and swiped those clean for her. Yeah. But but Susie's not thinking of the of the consequences that that might cause. You know, she doesn't really care. It's like, look, the government can figure out. If the government consumes a trillion dollars in student loans, it's really not my problem, the issues that causes for the government. The government can figure that out. But all I know is I don't have to pay those loans. And right. it's good for me. Um. But there is just huge consequences I don't think people think about when you talk about socialized medicine, a social government, you know, paying off student loans. I mean, in theory, it sounds great. If there was a way we could be like, hey, you guys, I went to college. You guys are going to con- uh, contribute to the community and, and whatever trade you guys go into, let's wipe those clean. And it's not going to affect the government or taxpayers or anybody else or, or our, uh, you know, the, the strength of our dollar. Yeah, let's do it. You know, I'm all for it. But that's not the case. It's been tested in other countries. We have that data. We have the data not only from our own country, from other countries. We can look at the historical consequences of massive amounts of debt too. Like that that's the other thing that people have to consider during these things, which is as they slow down the economy and as they, you know, print more money. What does that do to the currency? What does that do to the overall value of the currency, the American currency? Uh, I don't, obviously, I'm not an economist, but I do kind of understand it in principle, which is when you have a devalued currency, when you've taken on massive amounts of debt and you just continue to print money, what ultimately happens is inflation. And uh, that means the dollar isn't as strong internationally, which means that we can't, do some of the things that we need to do as a country strategically and really manage strategic threats the way that we could when the dollar is strong. Because ultimately, I think having a strong dollar is a huge, uh, we'll call it benefit to our strategic advantage internationally. I, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that's, that's that part of it is, you know, the United States runs... Uh, we'll call it the international commerce. And uh, China would love to have that position, by the way. Like they would love to have that position. And the more we get sucked in as a country to these individual needs and necessities that devalue currency and take a, and, and take more debt and more money that we have to print in order to pay for this bullshit, ultimately the less power and significance that we have internationally I'm not the guy that's going to say we need to exert power militarily, international all the time. That's definitely not my position because I do believe that we found ourselves in endless wars that are that are directly contradictory to the American to American values. I, I truly believe that we should not be in the in the business of just going into the Middle East and fucking flipping the cart upside down. And, and it's our responsibility to, to, to fix all that shit. Like I really don't, but I do believe we are probably the most ethically driven country that enforces, I would say commerce through the dollar internationally. I would, I would hate to imagine a world where China was in charge of that because people, if they think 
that, you know, and there's a section of the country that obviously loves to villainize this country, uh, which I, I, I could never agree with the, the, you know, 99.9% of any of that narrative. Uh, <laughs> but you haven't seen anything yet compared to an international hegemonic Chinese driven economy. Like talk about general exploitive subjugation. Like it is, it is going, it, when I say it, if, if it's trending towards that direction, our international fear should be thinking this is a really incredibly brutal future. It really is. Uh, and I don't want to be a fucking defeatist or, you know, paint a bleak future because ultimately I do believe that, you know, freedom and democracy, uh, the, the, you know, the capacity for logic will prevail. I do. I believe those things. And maybe I'm probably too much of an optimist. But if we get guys like uh, Brett Weinstein, for instance, being kicked off social media where he doesn't have a voice, that does become a problem because ultimately we can't start muting you know, true thought leaders and intellectuals because those are the people that ultimately kind of need to inspire, I think, true leadership and intellectual direction. Uh, you have too many dum dums out there, you know, that have a 120 character fucking platform that have no ability. <laughs> you know what I mean? They have no ability to think through a process or the second or third or third order effects of anything. And by the way, those are the people you should be listening to. I mean, the majority of the journalists out there are just regurgitating information and they're just kind of it's writing bullshit. Yeah. yeah. They're not doing research. I mean, journalism in America right now is fucking dead at this point. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have Coffee or Die, coffeeordie.com. Uh, it's a fantastic <laughs> blog. Uh, there's no incentive to research. There's all the incentive to gaslight, spin people up. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why I love podcasts because you can fucking dive into these things and, you know, talk to guys like you that own a gun store. You know, what, what I worry about with, with, um, the gun industry and gun stores in general is they're already under so many different regulations. Uh, I, I, I worry that it will kill like small gun business. And I hope that's not the case. I really do. I hope that's not the case. I hope we can navigate our way through it. Like we majority, majority of the time we've been able to, and, but and how are we going to like, look through the next couple of years and think about the gun Time industry. Tell when, you know, they're like, hey, we're not putting you out of business. All we're saying is all you can sell is revolvers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Seriously. Like you guys can still sell revolvers and pump action shotguns. Okay. And, that's and that's all you guys rifles. and bolt action rifles. But you can't sell this type of ammunition. That's another thing that was on that bill was uh, the c controlling types of ammunition, obviously closing um to, to conduct sales at a, like a gun show, you have to have enough FL what at which point. What kind of ammunition do they want to restrict? It, it wasn't, I, I didn't, it's not oh, in there. It's it. not clarified. It's just another one of those very vague, like, you know, like back classify end, background it as like military on ammunition. ammunition or yeah. some crazy ass shit. Those murder bullets. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, that's what it is. It's like, look, we're not coming in and shutting you down. We're just telling you. We're just telling you you can't you sell can, the majority of, of the, anything. Of the stuff that you guys sell. You hey. know, you guys can sell this. You guys can open a candy shop in your store. <laughs> um, you which guys we can have, sell by the way. We have, a new, we have a new candy uh, shelf at Ready Gunner. Do you really? Thanks to Buff Cookie, yeah. It's actually really good for me and bad for me. You can... You can sell Nerf guns and can openers. Like yeah, that, that's BB where you're going, you know, or, um, hey. But not full auto BB guns. And I've heard it from a section of the society where they're like, we, they want to serialize. They've, they've talked about serializing ammunition and like individual rounds and all these. Like, yeah, a lot of the stuff that's already in place in California. So right. it's like, look, you want to buy 223 ammo. You have to show me your license with your registered AR-15 that wow. you actually have a gun that takes that kind of ammo and that gun is registered or you can't buy it. And you have to pass this background check every time you buy a 20 round box of 223. I mean, just completely ridiculous wow. stuff. Um, at which point it's like... I don't why? know, but that's, but that's why you're seeing the influx of all the sale of ammunition and everything else you are right now. People see this stuff coming down the pipe and they're getting right. ready for it. So they're like, well, shit, if I can't buy this stuff, I need to get it right now. 
Yeah. In this national race. I mean, you, you're going to have a, a lot of not, and I don't blame them. You, you're going to have a lot of non-complying citizens that don't comply. They're going to essentially create a black market for this stuff yeah. is what's going to happen, you know? Um, and, and all these, and all these laws, and you, anytime you try to prohibit something, obviously, I, you know, there, there should be prohibition for certain types of item. Like, I don't think anyone should be going around snorting cocaine in the streets. Well, definitely not with um, the belt fed machine gun. Yeah. Like I think yeah. like those two things combined yeah. I mean, can, can be dangerous. I'm just saying, I don't know. But you, you know, you, you make these, you, I've seen this t-shirt, you, you, you make these things illegal and you just start creating outlaws, you know? People are still going to do what they want to do to a certain extent. So I, I don't know. I, th I think it's actually in, a, in disfavor of the government for them to pass these kind of laws. Well, I think what it does is it, it, it keeps the government in good business, right? So, you know, the more laws, like, I think that's what people need to understand is like... The more fines, the more... Yeah, the more fines, the more people they have to hire, the more people they have to enforce. Like, it's like, they're in the business of kind of their business. And... You know, the more rules and regulations, the more laws, the more reforms, the more policies, the more whatever, right? It means the more people, the more budget, the more taxes. And it's like, where does it end? And I think that's the thing that 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 people have to really think about is to what degree is your the sacrifice of individual liberty? Where does this end? Like when you just continue to to just and what I see it, and I think I've said it on on the podcast is like where 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 it's headed is you know the internet is going to be just nothing but like you know Amazon unboxing videos, you know, <laughs> so you can show people what you bought on Amazon and like cat videos. I think like it's just I like think that's Casey what did it one is. Of those the other day, it's like cat videos and unboxing videos and you better be wearing a mask, you know, oh, yeah. or you're going to be deplatformed. Your post is going to get yeah. deleted, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like wear your mask while you're posting your cat videos or unboxing videos from Amazon or you're going to get deplatformed, right? So, you know, conform to the tech oligarchs narr narrative at any, at any cost. Sacrifice all individual liberty. Forfeit and where I saw it is like this this dystopian like 1984 type scenario where everybody lives and, and works in Amazon facilities to pay for their Amazon merchandise so they can log into YouTube to watch Amazon unboxing videos, right? Like it's like with your mask on. And <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be a new uh it's gonna be the new thing, you know, the makeup videos you see where it's gonna be who has the cutest mask, you know. Yeah, who has the it's cutest mask. Like you have mask. a wardrobe of just masks, you know, ones with glitter on them and cute little sayings on the front. It, may, it makes me want. It, it at times I'm like, man, it makes me want to just like try to find a hundred acre plot somewhere, and put up a big fucking high fence, and but you still got to pay property taxes on it. You know? Yeah, I know. I, I well, I think Alaska is the the last state in the union where it's actually. You can stake land. The, I don't know if you can stake land there, but because of the share and petroleum profits from the state, it actually works out to your economic benefit to own taxes because it's a non-taxable state. You don't pay income tax. And then they actually distribute a check typically every year based on on, on petroleum. So I, I think about it and I'm like, man, maybe Alaska is like the right, the right move. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's, <laughs> I mean, dude, there's still a lot of food that's just like roaming around out there. You know, I love moose. You love moose. And swimming moose. around. And swimming. Yeah, yeah. Swimming. Lots of fish. I, I think, you know, based on, based on where things are trending, I think maybe Alaska is looking pretty fucking good. Yeah. I could build a cabin on the tundra. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, not to, not to, you know, capstone with bleakism. Uh, I don't even know if that's a word, but I, I do think the well, the country will be able to navigate through this. I really do. I I think there are a lot of people that are really angry uh, and they, you know, um, there's a lot of people in the country that are, that are fucking really angry for a lot of these guys have, a lot of these people have legitimate reason you know, uh, small business owners in New York and Los Angeles and a lot of these people within these states, like, man, they, they have every fucking reason to be really pissed off right now. 
you know, take away ability, our ability to feed our families and then say, everything's going to be okay because, you know, the government's going to fucking help you. Like, okay, dude, we've heard that one before. We've heard that one before, you know. At this point, if anybody believes the government's going to help you, I mean, it's... You that's some fairy tale. You, you need help. That's some fairy tale horse shit. Is oh, yeah. what it is. It's they're they're, and I think it's inherently it's it's broken, which is good, but it's also bad because ultimately, the 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 disjointed nature and the siloing of the United States government and the kind of the rollover and change in in organizational leadership every two to four years, uh, it causes a lot of chaos, which ultimately means that most of the time we're left the fuck alone, right? But if they get their shit together and nothing good happens really fast, I think in the government, right? It's like, you know, when, when we vote in, for instance, would be, we got to go to war in Iraq. We got to go to war in Iraq. Like we got to fucking, you know, we, we don't have time to, to read this entire bill. We got to pass it tonight. You know, it's like, oh, okay. Every time we've done that, that ultimately is bit us in the ass, on a wide variety of like economic and, you know, civil liberties perspective, right? It's, it's just bit us in the fucking ass. And the, the way bills are passed in the government, it, I mean, it is, it is complete 100% just crooked, um, blatant robbery. I mean, look, if you look at the bills, like the, the stimulus bill, right? Yeah. Where they're like, hey, we'll give you 600 bucks. This, this bill, you have this to vote bill. for it because we're going to give you 600 bucks, maybe 2,000 bucks if you vote on that. But with that bill, you have to accept these 3,000 other things. Like if you want your money, you, get you, ha- you have to vote for the bill as a whole. We threw a thousand other things in there. And, and that's money to Pakistan and all these other things, you know, where it's like, well, I don't really, I don't want that. I just want this portion, but I don't want that. Like I mean, going the, into the, a restaurant ordering a sandwich, and then they're like, "But you also got to take this donkey. You have to you have miracle, take this you donkey have to with have, you too. <laughs> it has to have Miracle Whip and anchovies on it, <laughs> yeah. and you have to take it. That's how we make it. And and you got to take this donkey and this wild fucking monkey. Like uh, you got to take this stuff home <laughs> with you. You're gonna take this fucking." Crazy fucking donkey, this goddamn monkey. We should. And, we need to make a video. Of that. We need to make a parody of the stimulus. Of the, of the stimulus, like here's your sandwich that yeah. you wanted so bad. And, and again, also, he brings out a donkey on a rope. This is a them. rotten tuna hat that you got to wear for the next thirty days while you eat your sandwich. while you eat your fucking sandwich. And also, this is Butch. He's going to punch you in the fucking face every thirty seconds. Do you want your sandwich or not? Yeah, eat your sandwich. You gotta eat this fucking sandwich. This is Butch. He's gonna punch you in the face. This is your new donkey and your wild ass monkey. Fucking take it home, man. This is your shit. Why aren't you happy with your sandwich, dick? Yeah. That's what it is. It, it literally, it, it's the equivalent of the stimulus bill is yeah. getting punched by Butch and having to take a monkey and a donkey home with a tuna hat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, Neil. Thanks, man. This is Free Range American. Where can people find you? Uh, my Instagram is yep. Neil, N-E-A-L, just yep. at Neil, uh, ready gunner is at ready gunner and then ready gunner.com is a website. Yeah. I, well, for now, for, for now, it's, for now, <laughs> for while we're now. still up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Until the Google servers, uh, yeah. shut us down. All right. Thanks buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks. Ed. See you.